My name is Ton Smets. I work together with Harvard and Brink at Inexus and also Elad, and we work on cool innovations. Uh, I myself have a background in software engineering. Uh, this is my second meetup already. Uh, the last time we presented the IOTA charging station and the cool mini Tesla. I think most of you will remember that one at least. Uh, and today we have a new demonstrator and a new view uh, that we would like to share with you. So uh, be prepared. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you for being here, everybody. It's really lovely to see everybody. And also at home, uh, if you're watching the live stream, especially uh, for Mark Dobrivijer, I told him I would do that. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Han van der Brink, like uh, uh, Ton just said. Um, we, I, I actually like that this, this is already the fourth time we, we, we are here. Um, and every time we show something new, so we'd like to build something, bring it here, and then show what we've built. Um, so it's not different this time. Uh, you can see it in the front, uh, the device, what we build, and we will talk you through it uh, in the presentation, what we did. Um, I will give a general introduction why we build it, and Tom will go to into the technical details about it. Okay. It works? It should. I don't hear myself like I did before, but it's going to change, I guess. Yeah, that works now. <laughs> Okay, um, I have a clicker. So what we talk about today is that we um, will talk about a self-balancing grid. Um, and you might ask, what the heck is that? Um, but we will tell you about it, what it is, and uh, explain a bit more about it. Um, but first, I would like to thank the two companies that made this, or um, uh, companies that made this possible. One is Elad, it's a foundation on e-mobility, um, all sorts of protocols, technical, innovations and even charging stations uh, uh, we placed. So that's, uh, that's uh, the first one I would like to thank. And the other one is Inexus, who made it possible to, uh, to actually be here and to create this demonstrator to show what kind of innovative things you can do if you use a, a distributed ledger. Uh, and a special thanks to my colleague Klaas van Zure, who built that device, the physical one, with all the hardware and stuff and everything inside. He's a real genius. Uh, in, in building such a thing, so I would like to especially thank him uh, for that. And to start with, why, as Inexus and Elad, are we looking at these kind of things? Why do we do it? Um, why do we even build stuff like this? Well, if you look in, in, in where the market is going, and if you look at, for example, our, our, our focus at Elad, charging stations, electric vehicles, you see that the number of charging stations is increasing, yeah, not exponentially, but kind of linear. Um, and the same thing is now happening with electric vehicles. You can see, can I point? Yes. You can see this one. This is the battery electric vehicle. So you have the plug-in hybrids, the, the ones who actually cheated a bit, uh, only for tax reasons probably they were bought. But what you see now is that the battery, battery electric vehicles are being bought more and more and more. Um, this means that we need to deliver much more energy using our grid. And this means that for a Nexus like a grid operator, we need to come up with different solutions um, to charge every car in the future, especially when everybody will be driving electric uh, and everybody needs to charge in the morning or in the evening when they come home or they arrive at work. Um, that's a whole change in the way we use the grid, especially when you think of that we put the cables in the ground like 50 or 60 years ago. So 50 or 60 years ago, we weren't thinking about electric cars. Well, maybe we were, but then we switched to, to gas and to, uh, to all the kinds of different fossil fuels. So we need to be prepared to the future where we need to deliver that amount of energy when everybody needs to, uh, to drive their cars. And since we're combining the mobility market with the electricity market or the grid, you are actually combining two critical infrastructures together. So we really need to think about how are we going to deal with this and what's the best solution. So we need to come up with uh, innovative uh, solutions to make that network very resilient. <coughs> so. I talked about this, um, but the thing is that we not only start charging our electric cars, but we also become a, what we call a prosumer. We don't always buy the energy, we even produce the energy ourselves. And that's what you see happening in the grid. People are buying, electric, or are buying solar panels, um, especially, for example, in the north of the Netherlands, where they are putting um, uh, huge amounts of solar panels on their roof. And you see that we have a challenge in that grid because usually when the sun is shining, people are not home and using the energy. They are only using that energy in the morning or at night when, they, when the sun is usually not shining. 
And everything gets connected. So we are connecting a lot of different devices. Everything is um, remotely controllable. So you also add ICT in that network, which means that you get cybersecurity challenges. Um, and everything probably in the future needs to be balanced in real time. So you have all these new things happening in the grid and really making us wonder how can we deal with that, what's, yeah, what, what we're going to do. <clears throat> so from the usual, usual top-down energy delivery from um, gas plants and things like that and coal plants, we now have the bottom-up uh, bottom approach. People are starting uh, with solar panels, windmills, so the, the whole way we use the grid is really changing. And that's why we need to come up with those solutions. So we have to rethink our grid. We have to come up with a, yeah, well, with a new grid or the way the, we use our grid in a new way with 21st century technology, that's how we, I would call it, to really match the, this uh, uh, demand that supply. So when you come home or when you want to charge, you should only charge when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. Um, so we need to come up with things like smart charging to only charge or only, let's say, use the heat pump when there's an abundance of energy. And that could differ from minute to minute or even quarter to quarter, an hour. And um, the way we see this could be done is to come up with like what we call self-sustainable islands. Let's say in your neighborhood, when you become an island where everybody who can produce energy and store energy, this whole island can be self-sustainable. So you charge the batteries uh, during the day, and in the night you use the same energy from the battery. And that whole neighborhood could be self-sustainable. And if you connect multiple of these islands together, you get a very resilient network because all these islands can be self-sustainable by itself. So if, if one just fails by delivering energy, the others could probably help. So if you build this up, it would become a real resilient network um, uh, like we don't know it right now. So how do we get here then? And what's the connection with the IOTA charger we talked before? Well, we did that because we thought of, thought of it in a way that if you have those, all those smart devices in your network, um, those devices can communicate with each other. And we started with that uh, wooden box, which was the first pilot of a charging station. Then we had the charger really outside, and it's still there. So if you want to visit us in Arnhem, you're welcome to, to come by. It's actually there, and you can always use and see it. To move into uh, an, a smart device and integrate that smart device into our even becoming smarter grid. So the way we see is that if you have autonomous devices in your grid that it can decide by itself to use energy or to discharge or to give energy back to the network, and those devices can forecast their energy need, you get much more smarter yeah. networks than what we call a smart grid right now. And what makes those grids smart? It's devices that are connected to the grid. Those are the ones that make that grid smart. So that's the way we see it, and that's what we try to build here. So what if we can ask devices to behave in a certain way that actually helps or benefits the grid? That's what we are talking about today. And it's all about energy sharing, grid balance. So, and if you do that, everything has to be administered. Everything needs to be stored and saved, and everything needs to be paid for. Um, so we thought, yeah, we need something to do that, especially if you think of decentralized islands that are uh, running on their own, and you have multiple of them, you have to have s s some sort of solution that works. So that's where a DLT like IOTA come in, uh, comes in. So that's what we will talk about um, right now, and Son will guide you to all the technical details what we build to really see uh, what we build and how that works. All right, thank you, Harm. I'll stand here, it's a bit easier for me. All right. So as Harm already told you, um, and I want to emphasize that a bit more, uh, we created a demo with a specific set of devices, uh, but we want all household devices to become part of a smarter grid, uh, of a self-balancing grid. Uh, so keep that in mind. We, of, of course, we chose a charging station, actually some virtual charging stations uh, for this demo. But it could also work with your washing machine, your heat pumps, your other household appliances. Uh, your bread toaster, your fridge, uh, your coffee maker, etc. Uh, so the demo we created, it consists of a few parts. Uh, we created four uh, virtual charging stations uh, and one uh, virtual transformer. Uh, keep in mind that this virtual transformer is actually 
uh, using real data. So at the ELA, the now premises in Arnhem, um, we have a very smart team of guys sitting there uh, that actually transformed the transformer uh, on the premises into a smart device. So we can get all kinds of data from it. So uh, actual uh, current usage, um, voltage, uh, total power usages, etc. We can get it at any time interval we want. Um, so we took this real data and we combined that with some uh, more affordable hardware. Uh, I will come back to that a bit later. Uh, we chose some easy to use libraries, uh, the IOTA library, uh, and we created a demo that is using IOTA for every uh, data transaction and also for every value uh, transaction. So uh, there's actually a machine to machine economy uh, where devices are directly paying each other. All right, let's go a bit more into the hardware. Uh, you can see the, the nice blue and green box there. Uh, it's, a, it's a wooden box with some beautiful stuff inside. Of course, like we did in the charging station, we took the Raspberry Pi uh, as the foundation. Uh, but on top of that, as you can see, we put five beautiful touchscreens. And this was an um, uh, easy decision for us because the first demonstrator uh, that we showed last year uh, the, the new charging station, it was more of a, uh, a fixed thing and you actually needed to go there, um, have an electric car to interact with it, uh, have a wallet uh, to work with it, and now we wanted to create a demo uh, that is more easy to use and more portable. Uh, so we decided to take some touch screens uh, so the people that are working with the demonstrator can actually change variables, uh, start and stop transactions uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, of course, we need to power it, so uh, in there we have a very beefy 5-volt uh, USB uh, power supply. Uh, we are running our own network internally, so inside the box we have a network switch and everything is uh, wired. This also makes it easy during development to upload new software and to do uh, updates. Of course, a lot of cables. <coughs> And we decided to incorporate a small router device. It's a, a actually it's a travel router, and it allows us to make that uh, demonstrator very portable. So we can use a wired Ethernet connection, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, USB tethering, and even a USB um, a SIM reader. Uh, so you can use Vodafone or uh, T-Mobile, for example. All right. So what's inside? Uh, what we also al always tend to do is to start on our desk. So we start hacking around with uh, loose cables, Raspberry Pis, uh, um, and all the devices that we eventually want to incorporate into a nice demonstrator. Uh, so what you see on the bottom left here is actually the inside of the box. Uh, it's a cool photo without cover. I have a bigger version in the next slide. Uh, the top left is uh, the actually the assembled front. So after development uh, and test fitting, um, we decided to do a demo run. On the top right, you see uh, the wooden box without hardware, but being wrapped. You see this also makes a great demonstrator because visuals, uh, of course, add a lot uh, to a great concept. And on the top right, uh, you see it in action. And that's also what you can see over there. Uh, so I will. Cool, yeah, so I'll guide you through it. Uh, we have the uh, travel router on the top there. We have five uh, Raspberry Pis, um, the USB power, the network switch, and here we have a on-off switch and the connector for the uh, AC power. <coughs> what we also like to demonstrate with this is that it's not, not difficult or hard to make, it, uh, to make something with IOTA or to make a nice demonstrator if you want to show a real good concept. Um, just take what you have, uh, buy some cheap hardware and just make it work, get going. Don't worry about uh, how it will look or what people might uh, say about it. Just do it and you will also end up with, uh, with something cool yeah, and something you can demonstrate and it will help a lot in uh, actually maturing your concept. All right, then it's a great idea to uh, get into the software part. We have a few actors uh, in the system. Uh, as I told, the uh, transformer at the ELAT and our premises. Um, the transformer is capable of sending data to endpoints. So what we did is we created an endpoint uh, on a dedicated server. We have a bit of backend running uh, to gather this uh, data. Uh, this server is actually publishing the transformer data onto the Tangle. 
Um, this is one of the most important steps because the uh, virtual charging stations are actually listening to these messages. And this is happening con continuously. So every 15 seconds we receive new uh, data from the transformer. It's put onto the tangle. Uh, it's there. Uh, it's fixed. Nobody can change it. And everybody can see it. Um, so the virtual charging stations use ZMQ. Uh, zero MQ to actually uh, listen to uh, incoming transactions uh, with transformer data. Uh, we decided to do this because it's the, uh, one of the most lightweight solutions, besides, uh, for example, using a MEM stream. Uh, but we wanted to keep it, uh, well, even more simple than a MEM stream. Um, and the IOTA Tangle indeed is uh, supplying the data to the virtual charging station. Uh, and the charging station is also publishing its uh, power usage values onto the tangle. And this is also what uh, the transformer then uses again uh, to calculate what's happening, uh, how, bi how big the uh, energy usage is uh, of the charging stations combined. Of course, normally you would have some kind of a meter uh, connected to a charging station, so you can be sure that uh, the actual data that is being sent from the charging station itself to the tangle is correct. So you would have some validation. Uh, because, we don't, because it's virtual and we don't have a meter connected, we also had to uh, push some data to the backend, uh, which is then the official meter. Uh, and the backend is then constantly calculating what the total load is of the charging stations. Uh, and it's plusing that uh, on top of the actual transformer usage. So we have a piece of real data of the actual power usage at the ELAT and our premises. On top of that, we have some virtual uh, uh, power, and we have a threshold uh, that actually shows the maximum load of the transformer. I have a slide that hopefully makes it a bit more um, uh, easy to understand. Uh, first, I want to show you the, the interface we built. Uh, this is the transformer interface. It's the top screen and the demonstrator. Um, you see some uh, tangle data, so the time and the hash of the latest received <coughs> transaction. We have some logs, so you can see what's actually going on in the background. Uh, and also see if your update button uh, did respond. Uh, on the bottom right, uh, we have some metrics. This is all coming directly from the tangle. So once it receives a new uh, message via ZMQ, uh, it will get uh, that specific message from the tangle, and it will uh, add the data points to the chart. Uh, the top left uh, actually shows the total load of the transformer and also the transformer limit. Uh, and because we built a demonstrator, we made a, a sliding bar to actually uh, make it a bit more variable. So while giving a demo, you can just slide with uh, the slider to update the threshold. And what will happen then? Uh, is that you will see that the charging stations will receive messages. Hey, um, I'm go getting to the, to the threshold. Uh, I'm getting to my maximum power. Uh, please scale down by 15%, 20%. And you will also see that the charging stations react. Um, we also have the charging station itself, of course. Um, a part of the data is the same. <coughs> What's different is that you have controls, so you can actually start and stop um, charging uh, sessions. Uh, you have some more uh, information. So on startup, uh, a virtual charging station will get a set of um, properties. It will get so, uh, a configuration. <coughs> so in this case, we have a three-phase charger that is uh, capable of pulling uh, 63 amps uh, max. It's quite a beefy charger. Uh, and also the tangle data. So because it is machine to machine, you will also see that every actor in this uh, demonstrator has uh, its own wallet. So uh, this charging station has funds. Uh, and it's also possible that funds are not confirmed yet. And you will see them uh, within the brackets. And once they are confirmed, they get added to the actual funds of the charging station. Uh, we also have some logging, uh, but it's cool, I think, afterwards, after our presentation, People can take a look and uh, ask some more questions. <coughs> All right, control logic. So as I told, we have a few uh, types of data. Uh, we have a threshold. Uh, this is the absolute maximum uh, that the transformer can go in terms of power usage and also power delivery. 
Uh, we have some general load. This is the actual load of the eLadder now premises. So we cannot uh, do anything with that. So if the threshold would be close to the load that we already have there, we are practically unable to uh, adjust the power usage of the charging stations to get below this threshold. So that's something we had to work with. Uh, and on top of that, we have some space that we can actually use for the chargers to charge cars. Of course, it's virtual, so it's just numbers and graphs, but I think it, it really shows the uh, potential of this uh, uh, technology. So what's happening? Uh, we have a car that uh, plugs in, we have some load, and that's fine. As long as we stay underneath the threshold, uh, nothing special happens. <coughs> the car can charge at maximum capacity, no worries. And as long as that continues, of course, no problem. But there will be a time that, uh, for example, two or three more cars plug in, uh, and you go above the threshold. Um, for a transformer, this is not necessarily a direct uh, problem. It can deliver a bit more than it's actually capable of in spec um, for a few minutes, but not for hours or for days. So it's it important that uh, once you see uh, a, a higher usage uh, than you want, that you start acting on it. So what happens then is the transformer uh, sees it and it will start uh, updating its messages to the Tangle. So along with uh, the power usage data, it will say, okay, I want you to smart charge and I need your power usage to go down by 15%, 20%. In this case, I chose 20%. And by the next reading, if it goes below, it will say, okay, that's fine. You can just go on again. This is a stupid uh, rule actually because you will see some fluctuations. In the future, we hope to extend this uh, to be even smarter. So as long as we stay then beneath the threshold, not, uh, there's no problem. <coughs> we go over there again, and it will start sending messages uh, to scale down and power usage, and so on, and so on. Uh, all right, so uh, what we use to build this uh, are all uh, highly available and uh, affordable uh, pieces of hardware and software. <coughs> of course, we have the Raspberry Pis with the Raspbian OS, so it's basically Debian, easy to use. Uh, Electron for the uh, GUI. Uh, we chose this because it's uh, multi-platform, it's easy to develop, uh, and it allows other people to easily get started with uh, the base we deliver. So it's also on GitHub, so take it, install the dependencies and get going, it's easy. Uh, Electron is Node.js together with uh, some pieces uh, of Angular. <coughs> we chose Chart.js for the chart, so the data is loaded into there and we were able to customize uh, some properties. Of course, the IOTA JavaScript library, and we uh, used PowServe.io. Why did we do with this? Uh, the Raspberry Pi is actually not capable of constantly uh, doing the proof of work for um, uh, making transactions and generating addresses. So we decided to offload some of that work to PowServe. Uh, so if we make a transaction on a Raspberry, <coughs> the actual uh, heavy lifting is done over there. At the beginning of the uh, meetup, I published, or I, put, uh, I changed the, the repository from private to public. So uh, please find it, get started, uh, do stuff with the base we deliver to you. Uh, and I would like to hear uh, how you like it. And if, if possible, I would li like to add a few yeah, more notes. Sure. Um, there will be a Medium blog post about this, so everything will <coughs> be written down in much more detail. Uh, you can watch it after this, uh, after this meetup. Um, and I would, I would like to stress the cool thing about this, because we showed that we, in, in this demo, have virtual charging stations that uh, adjust the energy consumption, but it could be any device. It could be a heat pump, could be a, ba a stationary battery that changes the load over time. Um, and another thing is that all the devices that are involved, they are not forced to follow the request to lower the energy. Uh, they only ask to, but if they do, they get a small, refee, a small fee in return. So I think that's a very important part of this uh, setup, that, it's that, that we don't force people to, or, or, si or systems or uh, hardware to follow a certain behavior, but that we just ask them to do that. And if they do that, they would get a small fee in return. Uh, so I think that's uh, it's very important. Uh, obviously, everything will be open source available, like Ton said. Um, and I think this could be one of the building blocks you could use in the hackathon. Um, 
because a lot of things are already done for you. Uh, you can just copy paste it and uh, change a few parameters and then use it. Um, uh, obviously, you need to do some changes to make your own idea. <laughs> but I guess this this already adds to to the hackathon. Um, and I think uh, Nuon Vattenfall uh, is next to us. Uh, I would suggest that you uh, first do a short Q&A. Yes. This is really amazing stuff. Cool. Then we do the video. Mm -hmm. And then we interact with... Uh, Perfect. All of the, then Dave has another building block. Dave from the yeah, yeah. Foundation. And then we do the interactive part. Okay, so for the microphone, so everybody can hear it. Uh, we will first do a, a Q&A for five minutes. Then we'll do a, sw a short video from New and Vattenfall to, uh, to show the hackathon and their idea and that track. Uh, and after that, we will have some discussions about your ideas to use the same technology like we did or the building blocks to com come up with new ideas. So is there any question right now? It's the, the troll box. I did it in phase before with this thing. I'm not sure. Is the microphone of that thing on? I, I, otherwise, I'll repeat the question. Use it anyway. Yeah, good question. Yeah, good question. So the question was, how many transactions do we have in a, in a minute, so to say, to keep this uh, demonstration f of five devices running? And I think Tom yeah. can answer uh, to that. Yeah, I can. Let's pretty quickly. We <coughs> are, by the way, usually also in the top 10 from the Tangle monitor for uh, addresses we use in this, uh, in this demo. So uh, if you see <coughs> there, it's this. Yeah, we do quite a lot of transactions. Uh, so uh, this loop is running every 30 seconds, <coughs> but it's zero value. So that's not a problem. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is uh, very easy capable of, of doing that. Um, this is uh, next to the Tangle, so this is just a HTTP uh, post. But what's happening here is uh, the heavy part. Uh, once the transformer actually, uh, oh, this one, but we see it here. Once the transformer sees that a charging station uh, did listen to its request, uh, it calculates a small uh, reward actually for the for the charger uh, and it will keep that in mind and then every 10 minutes uh, what it does it's it's it will combine all these transactions into one big bin, uh, bundle so depending on the amount of ch uh, virtual chargers that you have this bundle can get really really big uh, and it will throw that uh, directly to the iota tangle uh, and what we saw is that it takes quite some time to get that bundle through and actually, the charging stations themselves are also sending data constantly to the Tangle. So I think every 15 seconds, yeah. a message is sent to the Tangle. Uh, and besides running uh, the GUI and sending the messages, it was just a bit too heavy. And we were able to, well, uh, make it work with just this bit of offloading. Yeah. So I would say like, like once every five seconds, yeah. at least in transaction from one of those devices. Yeah. But it's up to the devices to do that. By the way, we had some, the, the cool thing to just add, um, <laughs> this is a wooden box and it's all closed. We thought that's cool because then it's all closed and you can destroy it. But <laughs> when you put in multiple Raspberry Pis that have to calculate a lot of things and updating charts, it gets really quickly very hot. <laughs> so uh, we had some throttling before. So those are the things you also run into when you start to developing things <laughs> like that. So keep that in mind. We didn't. There's a question. Uh, my question is um, the uh, the charge points, mm -hmm. uh, do they equally uh, go up or, or down when the uh, t transformers uh, uh, has no energy left? Or can you uh, prioritize on uh, charge points, for example? Yeah, in, in this demo, uh, we didn't prioritize in which charging station should <laughs> go up or should go down. It was just a general request from the transformer to go up by, or to go down by 20%, so to say. And it's up to the devices to, to listen or not. And those devices all listen, but you could change that. Um, and actually, what Tom already said, because we had an algorithm which is not really smart, so it starts oscillating over time, because it doesn't um, do an error check. So you don't have a, an error check in how much you go, should go up or down over time. Uh, so that's something you could really change in the next version. 
and even prioritize, that's, that's for sure. So but to ask, ask, answer your question, no, there's no prioritization, but that's a good thing. It should be maybe in the next version. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. There it is. Yes, uh, I have a question regarding the, uh, the data you sent to the Tangle. I assume you are running your own node. Yeah, multiple. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if uh, you are sending multiple uh, transactions per minute, yeah. uh, so there's a lot of data stored on the Tangle, uh, on, on your node. Mm -hmm. What happens during a snapshot? Yeah, that's a good. That's actually a good thing. That we actually run into one of those things um, because if you want to look up, if you want to look up data before the snapshot happened, it's not there anymore. Uh, but depending on the node you request, it it can be there, and that's the thing uh, IOTA needs in the future. And already uh, people are already storing that is all the history data of all the transactions over time. <coughs> so what we call perma nodes. Yeah, but but you are you are you are not. Uh you are not uh, applying a snapshot uh, because otherwise all your data is. Uh, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. So you you are, in fact, your own permanent. Y yes, and I think everybody who runs a node gets the same data, so everybody is storing actually all the data we are sending around in here, because usually people try this on testnet uh, or devnet. I should call it devnet, Dave. Right? Sorry. Uh, I try it on devnet, but we don't want to test it on devnet. We want to have this on real on mainnet. So we because we want to experience the real things. Um, that you face once you do this, um, and and if you really want to build something that should work um, for real, you have to use the I think the, the real mainnet to face all those challenges. Uh, so that's why we did uh, it on mainnet, and so that's why every node now has to store all the information we send around, even right now running this uh, this demo. So how large is your uh, disk pretty, space? Pretty big. Okay. <laughs> uh, another question is regarding the uh, the root key. Yes. Because um, all parties must know the root key from the ELA transformer. Yeah, that's the thing. So how do you s send the? Uh, because n at this moment, the root key must be known by the virtual charging station. Yeah. So th at some point, um, okay, you can give it to no, the no, virtual no. charging station, but maybe in the future you want to change it. How do you send this uh, root key over then? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question, especially because we don't call it a root key, but just the address to, to listen to. Um, this is just one device, and with all known devices and all known transformers, and it's just one transformer with four devices. But if you scale this up with multiple transformers and multiple devices in different <coughs> areas of the grid, you have to know the different addresses of all those transformers to really listen to the right one, because if you listen to this one in your own grid, it will probably not work. So those are the things we didn't cover in this proof of concept. Um, but that, that's a very important thing to come up with and to deal with if you really want to scale this up. How to know the right address to listen to um, and how to get involved in that sub-network uh, or island, so to say, of that network. That's a very important thing. Okay, w one last question. Sure. Uh, the, uh, you're using uh, mask authentication messaging? No, no, we're not using it this. We're just sending plain text messages so everybody can see what's inside the messages, because we want people to, to really see this. Okay. And, and because the transformer has its own address, um, the devices can listen to that address, and everybody can send to that address all the information needed. So that's the way we did it right now. Okay, that's okay. Now I understand that you can uh, charge, uh, because in the mom, in mask of that messaging, you cannot, uh, uh, ch uh, um, how do you say it? Uh, Pay, uh, there's no payment uh, method included in. No, no, but you could use the same addresses to make a payment. But there is no payment included in uh, yeah. mask authenticated messaging, no. All right. Okay.